The study of history isn't just names and dates. It's not just people and places. It's the story of the world of ideas, of social meanings and social movements. It's the story of humanity in context. It's Academe Today. Hello and welcome back for another episode of Academe Today. I'm your host, Jamie Liddy. I'm excited to introduce you to a new member of the History Department at UNCP, Dr. David Walton. He's a specialist in African American history, he's fresh from completing a dual PhD at Michigan State University, and his recent research has been on transnational black consciousness in the 1960s and 70s. Welcome to the TV studio, Dr. Walton, and welcome to UNCP. Thank you very, very much. It's my pleasure. Now, I know it's a little late to be welcoming you. You've been here for a few months. How do you find it? How do you find our students? Oh, well, I, I love this university thus far. It's small, intimate, the community is small. Students seem eager uh, to learn at least the classes I've taught thus far. Uh, so I'm very pleased and I'm enjoying myself. Great, I'm glad. Now, I'm guessing you're originally from Michigan because all three of your degrees are from state schools in Michigan, is that right? Yes, I'm from Romulus, Michigan, which is about 20 miles west of Detroit, Michigan. Okay, and your undergrad was from Eastern Michigan University, is that right? Yes, ma'am. And what was that in? Uh, I received a bachelor's degree in African American Studies. Okay. Well, then you pursued that through all three of your degrees. Your master's degree was in world history, but with a certificate in African American history, yes? Uh, yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. And then the doctorate, tell me about that. That is a dual degree. It is. Uh, one was in history, which I focused on African American history, and the other was in what they call African American and African studies, in which I focused on African studies. Uh, for that portion of the dual degree. Uh, so it, it was challenging, more coursework, a little longer dissertation, but it was certainly worth it. Great. Now what led you to specialize in this field? Uh, that's a great question. Much of it was personal interest, uh, growing up, uh, things I would naturally inclined to be interested in, uh, things that I would talk to my friends about, but they didn't want to talk about them but they would just to uh, placate me, uh, to be honest. Uh, so when deciding, uh, when I went to undergrad, I didn't know what I wanted to major in, and I took uh, African, Intro to African American Studies first semester of my freshman year, and just fell in love with the discipline. And as most of us know, you only need 33 credits for a major. Well, one day I looked up and I had 67 credits in African American Studies, and my mom said it was time to graduate, so that made the logical choice <laughs> as my major. Uh, and then a brief time of teaching elementary school uh, and then serving in the military. Uh, when I got out of the military, I really didn't know what to do, so I reflected back on uh, things that interest me, what I could see doing for a living that didn't feel like work as much. Uh, and I thought about going back to school and uh, making the move to become at least a community college instructor. So I uh, returned to EMU to pursue a master's degree in world history with a graduate certificate in African American studies. And you got the PhD bug while you were there? I did, and part of it was uh, they have two tracks in the master's program in history at EMU. One is for uh, K through 12 teachers uh, who just need to maintain their certification. Then they have another track for those who intend to go on to pursue a PhD. So I did that track, which included writing a master's thesis. Mm -hmm. But then I taught at a community college and at Eastern Michigan University uh, as a part-time faculty for a few years. And I realized that I could make a lot more money <laughs> with a PhD. Uh, so I began the process of researching and investigating doctoral programs, what type of program would I want to pursue. And I narrowed it down to two. One was history and one was in black studies. And when I began researching programs based upon that narrow search, 
uh, I realized that Michigan State University uh, had PhD programs in both, uh, as well as uh, my interest in Africa, uh, and they are now number one, but they're always top three in PhDs in African history. So that made uh, Michigan State that much more uh, appealing and attractive. And then they had revamped their history department and strengthened it with a lot of scholars of the African American experience. Uh, and then you had great uh, African American scholars who had walked those halls in the past, like Dr. Darlene Clark Hine, who is now back at Michigan State University, as well as Dr. Pedro Dagbovi, who, is, uh, who was my dissertation chair. And he is the foremost uh, scholar on Dr. Carter G. Woodson, as well as uh, Booker T. Washington. Uh, so that attracted me as well. In your experience, are there more standalone departments these days in higher ed in terms of African and African American studies? Or would they be increasing uh, the number of uh, perhaps majors being offered and not standalone? What, what do you see as you go to your conferences or talk to your colleagues? Uh, great question. Now, on the graduate level, I'm seeing uh, a lot of programs that uh, offer master's and PhD degrees, but they do not have a department. For example, at Michigan State University, uh, African American and African Studies, uh, it's a program and not a department. And what I'm seeing across the country at other institutions are the creation of undergraduate minors, which operate as a program in a department of the so-called traditional disciplines. And I'm seeing that happen either in uh, English and literature departments, mm -hmm. in sociology departments, or in history departments. Uh, and part of the reason being is those disciplines are the, uh, for many ways, the backbone and pioneers of uh, African American studies, of black studies, as if you may. Uh, but there are a lot of departments that have sprung up offering uh, bachelor degrees uh, at four-year schools across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a mix, and much of the time it depends on the institution, it depends on the resources, and from my perspective, to be quite honest, it depends on the commitment the institution has to the discipline uh, beyond providing a space for a minor or a specialization. Right, it's funding faculty lines, yes. it's can we integrate it into the general education curriculum exactly. and all those things. Exactly, so Eastern Michigan University, they started as a department uh, granting bachelor's degrees and then they expanded to a graduate certificate and now they're in the process of expanding to offer a master's mm -hmm. degree. Uh, and then to juxtapose that, as I said, to Michigan State where you can get a minor or a undergraduate specialization, uh, but you cannot receive a bachelor's degree. But you can obtain a master's degree or a PhD, and that's a program. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the challenge is uh, that black studies is under siege. It's new, obviously, right, with the first being 1969 in San Francisco State, now San Francisco, uh, State University, but San Francisco State College. And then across the nation, black studies entered academia uh, in two ways. Uh, well, really three, student protests. Uh, and the third way is militant, violent uh, action, taking over of buildings. Some people were armed, to be quite honest with you. And then you had schools preemptively uh, institute black studies without the chaos on their campus but to prevent mm -hmm. that chaos from occurring and the nature of how it was introduced at many of those schools determines the nature it operates at that institution uh, the type of support or lack thereof that black studies receive at the institution but immediately upon its entree into the academic scene you had uh, pushback and we continue to have that push back in many places uh, in regards to black studies. A lot of people misinterpret black studies. Uh, they feel that it's some type of political or militant training camp, <laughs> for lack of a better way to put it. But it, it truly isn't. And uh, it's uh, academic study of the black experience from the perspective of African Americans and African diasporans using the African-centered 
and or Afrocentric paradigm and methodologies. Uh, but that can upset and alarm some people, particularly in different parts of the country. In a black studies class, you would get a totally different narrative on the creation and erection of Confederate memorials and monuments, for example, than you may get in another discipline or another curriculum. And for some people, mm -hmm. it will alarm them, but it's from the center of African descendants. And we have a particular historical and cultural view of those, for example, the Confederate monuments, then th that is distinct from maybe the larger majority population mm -hmm. in uh, the mainstream culture of America. So in coursework, you'll be reading Afrocentric theorists, Afrocentric uh, authors. You'll be... Um... Definitely uh, African-centered, because there's a distinction. Uh, Afrocentric is more like uh, an ideology, right? And African-centered is a methodology, so we're talking about okay. data collection, data analysis. And Afrocentricity also uh, steps in as an analytical tool, uh, much like maybe Marxism right. or feminist theory or uh, critical queer theory and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I definitely use the African-centered methodology when I teach uh, history courses. Uh, but as I'm given an opportunity moving forward to introduce new courses, uh, some of them I intend to be uh, interdisciplinary, so they'd be more of a kind of black studies. And it will be appropriate for students to read Afrocentric thinkers, people like Dr. Malefi Asante, mm -hmm. who is identified as a pioneer of Afrocentric thought, for example. Uh, but not just reading them for the sake of reading them, but also critically engaging them. Because uh, no philosophy is perfect. No ideology is uh, above reproach or above criticism. So there are some things that need, you know, that can be discussed and, and deconstructed and reconstructed. Right. Engage the literature. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Something that is very difficult to do nowadays because it seems the culture in America has moved away from critical thinking and just acceptance of what we are told and we now are in an environment where people prefer to live in an echo chamber. They only watch news outlets that provide information that they already agree with as opposed to being challenged on the left and right mm -hmm. uh, and et cetera, et cetera. So I, the challenge I'm finding as a junior scholar and a novice uh, teacher, uh, college professor, educator, uh, although I've been doing it a while, but I, I am still a novice, uh, is helping students, dragging them, kicking and screaming to the promised land of critical <laughs> thinking. <laughs> Good, great. Yes. Well, I know you're new here, but what can you tell us about African American studies at Pembroke? I think it's an interdisciplinary minor that's not housed in any one particular department? Yes, and it's ba the, 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 the crust of it thus far, to be uh, honest with you, has been in English and literature. Uh, but uh, it will be expanded, and that was one of the things that upon my hire that th they mentioned that they wanted me to do is engage in uh, African American studies, help expand it, and uh, help solidify it. So. Uh, it, it is, and that's one of the things I have to discover, and the students are going to have to drive it, to be quite honest with you. It won't be faculty. The students are going to have to lead the push uh, to maybe uh, to grant it more institutional permanency and mm -hmm. institutional support. If that means a bona fide program, if that means one day a department, and, and the reason why I say the students have to lead that, it's, it's their demand. That will, that will justify its presence. It's their commitment that will justify a fiscal commitment mm -hmm. in whatever fashion that is. Mm -hmm. If that means one day within the next five to 10 years, hiring tenure stream faculty with the sole assignment being African American studies. Uh, but that may not be the case, you know, and it, it, the students mm -hmm. for the most part will be the ones that fun, uh, that fuel that, that, that move. But I, I do have uh, some courses I am developing that 
will definitely fall within the purview of that African American Studies uh, course offerings. Mm -hmm. uh, one being a, a history of hip hop course that uh, I am developing. I don't know how soon it will be on the books, but it was submitted as part of uh, my two year rotation. So it'll probably be on the back end of that okay. two years. Okay, so uh, as a special topics course? As a special topics And then course. eventually you'll propose it to the curriculum committee and get it really on the exactly. books. Exactly, yeah. yes. Okay, and, and I'm fortunate to have uh, the support of the history department in that course, <clears throat> uh, and, and particularly uh, Dr. DeHart and Dr. Ryan Anderson. And Dr. Anderson teaches a history of rock and roll course. I know, and, and hip hop's really only a footnote uh, in the course. Yeah, you know, well, not, probably I, so because it's a rock and roll well, course. Well, sure, but, yeah, but yeah. so there's plenty of space for it to be a standalone definitely, course. Definitely, definitely. And I think it'll be one of those courses that students get really <clears throat> excited about for a myriad of reasons. What are some courses that we will see you in, for example, next semester? Awesome. Well, next semester I'll teach two surveys, well, two sections of the survey, Introduction to African American History. Uh, and I will be teaching the upper division history course, which is the history of sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it hadn't been offered in a while, so I really wanted to uh, get that offered again. So that's why that is the upper division course I selected for next semester. Uh, but moving forward, it will be I will teach the uh, survey course, which is uh, African American history until 1863, mm -hmm. and then the current survey course that I'm teaching three section of this semester, which is African American history since 1863, uh, as well as the upper division African American history course uh, that I'm teaching this semester. Uh, I apologize, I misspoke. Those two are upper division courses, African American history uh, to 1863, African American history since 1863. Then you have the general survey intro to African American history. Okay, so that's 1030, I think. 1030, history, 1030. is the and intro. And that counts as a gen ed. It counts as a gen yeah. ed. And uh, also uh, the African course, the African history course, uh, as well as I mentioned the history of hip hop. And then uh, there is, of course, history of the civil rights movement. So I will also uh, teach that. And then another course I will develop. Uh, the history of the black power movement. Okay. Uh, because that is something that I am what they would call a black power scholar. Uh, and, you know, in my dissertation work is a, on the black power movement. Right. Uh, and it's a growing field of specialization, uh, just as because it's now recently entered the realm of history. You know, right, uh, I was just going to uh, yes. say that, isn't it, what is it, 25 years? Well, yeah. what, what do historians say? We usually it? like to go with at least 25 years. And suddenly, but about it's, three, suddenly it's history. Yes, yeah. about okay. three decades. <laughs> so, you know, my students are always, they think Barack Obama is going to make an appearance in my course. And I say, there's no way. You're going to have to come back and your little brother or <clears throat> your children will have to be my students before Barack Obama makes an entrance in my I've course. gone so far <laughs> as to tell them the person can't be living, you know, <laughs> if they do a history of the media paper, yeah. uh, the person has to be dead, which I, that's a little strict, but. <laughs> well, a lot of information comes out after the fact and uh, a lot of uh, primary sources become available that weren't available mm -hmm. or that we didn't exist, didn't know existed. Uh, then we have what declassification, I mean declassifying of government documents. Just uh, we'll take uh, Dr. Peter Kornblatt who uh, used to run the National Archives and you know he must have been in the best position in the world because he was director when they declassified all of the Bay of, Bay of Pigs materials. He was the director of the National Archives when they declassified all of the Iran-Contra documents. So he had first dibs, mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. and he published first before anyone could <laughs> using those That's documents. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> but we know so much more about those things now mm -hmm. than in that moment as an example because of those primary sources. So that's one reason. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk about your dissertation. Um, like any good dissertation, it's got a long title that is uh, <laughs> descriptive of, of its parameters, right, of, of, you know, what does it do? Your dissertation is called Unapologetically Black, Parallel Institutions and Transnational Consciousness 
in the United States and South Africa, 1966 to 1982. And I know it involves at least six case studies. And I should mention, those are my formative years, <laughs> actually. I was born in 1966, and I okay. graduated high school in, in 84. But tell us about the significance of this time period for your comparison of American and uh, South African ideas. Well, based upon how I frame uh, the temporal parameters and establish the, uh, the, the, the lifespan of black power movement in the U.S., as well as the black consciousness movement in South Africa, they parallel one another, uh, and that's uh, 1966. Uh, and that would be uh, beginning with uh, the experiences of uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, and Stokely Carmichael and the residents of Lowndes County, Alabama with the Lowndes County Freedom Organization. Uh, and they started the political party called the Black Panther Party, uh, which honestly, Alabama law at the time required you to use a mascot f on the ballot for your party. Oh, for literacy purposes? Is Perhaps so, yes. Uh, so the Democrats, the Southern Democrats, they used a chicken, a rooster. So uh, Stokely Carmichael and the residents of Lowndes County, the black residents, they chose to use a Black Panther based upon uh, a folk tale that Stokely Carmichael and Fannie Lou Hamer had been told when they were working in the prior years in Mississippi trying to organize black voters. Uh, and that was that in the bayous in Mississippi that there was a Black Panther and the Black Panther will only eat racist white people. So that was folklore clearly, mm -hmm. right? Because how would the Panther know the difference between? I did not know the origins of the Black Panther Party was in the South, you know. I well, it's, it was they're in... two separate organizations okay. and that's where the confusion and Stokely Carmichael ended up joining the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, which was out of uh, the Bay Area, right. Oakland, California, okay. which was founded in 1966. Uh, but it was that experience was the first time that black power was put in action, as we understand it, as opposed to just being theorized. And across the ocean in uh, South Africa, uh, there was a bishop, Archbishop Shelby, had called a meeting and in that meeting, uh, it, it was the beginning and laid the groundwork for the black consciousness movement. Mm -hmm. uh, and that too happened in 1966. And I'm thinking Steve Biko was in college in 1966? Uh, actually, he was a lot younger than that. Oh, okay. Then. Yeah, yeah. And he gets all the credit, kind of like, in many ways, Stokely Carmichael or maybe even uh, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, they get all the credit with black power. Mm -hmm. But to be honest with you, it was people before them. So Fannie Lou Hamer should get the credit for the creation of black power. Uh, and Shelby, Archbishop Shelby in South Africa. Uh, Steve Biko would come along uh, as a student, a medical student, uh, sometime later. Uh, but it wasn't that long later. Mm -hmm. uh, he, I believe, if I recall right, he entered uh, medical school, uh, I believe, the following year. Okay. Because in 1969 is when he created his organization, SASO, that was a black student organization, which was the thrust of the mass black consciousness movement. So I start there so I can at least establish the political economy in the context of how these movements came to be and it also helps to establish the similarities and differences in the political economy in each republic as well as in the global political economy of what produced uh, this black identity politics in this fashion. And uh, so m to see after establishing that, after establishing a common canon that uh, black South Africans who were black consciousness adherents in black Americans were black power adherents, where they drew from. So they drew from the same black thinkers and black ideologies uh, that go back to the turn of the 20th century. The West Indian black radicals that made Harlem 
uh, so radical during the New Negro era, which some people call the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. uh, and those uh, West Indians and their relatives also going in the British Empire, because they came from the British Empire, going to places like South Africa. And then the countercurrent of that, which would be the more elitist black leadership of W.E.B. Du Bois and those, but then you had that in South Africa, and they came to the U.S and were taught by people like W.E.B. Du Bois at Fisk uh -huh. and at, when he was a faculty member at Fisk. People like uh, uh, Dube, who was the first, John Dube, who was the first president of the ANC and the founding president. His brother, for example, was W.E.B. Du Bois' student at, okay. at Fisk. And Saul Plackey, they call him the South African W.E.B. Du Bois, but he was heavily influenced by Du Bois, read a lot of Du Bois, exchanged letters with Du Bois. So we see this overlap, and then the ideas of people like uh, uh, Malcolm X, people like Franz Fanon, uh, and people like uh, 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 Kwame Nkrumah, and all these, and this cross-pollinization of these ideas, and how they interpreted them differently based upon their political economy. Now they're telling me we just have a couple okay. of minutes left, but um, you know I'm interested in what would be a key conclusion from your findings. You know, it would, would you say that um, uh, you know black was a, an important rhetorical strategy that could uh, unite otherwise disparate identities, or um, yes, in fact, black is a political identity. Right, African American in the context of the U.S. is an ethnicity, and our mm -hmm. nationality is American ethnicity, African American. Black is a political identity, and it was the same thing in South Africa. They adopted black as a political identity, so it was broad. So it meant all non-white oppressed peoples. So in the case in South Africa, Indians could be classified as black. In the case in the right. in the USA. Right that you know uh, indigenous Americans and Latinos they could be classified as black for in case of a political identity and we saw these things happening and the use of this political identity to provide services that the federal governments in both republics were either unwilling or unable to provide which is key in the current political climate in both republics where the government is either still unwilling or unable to provide these services. And the use of identity to organize and rally folk to then provide those services for themselves, which is one of the key pillars of black power and black consciousness, self-independence, self-determination, the slogan, black man, you're on your own. Right. I'm sorry we're out of time <laughs> because we, we could do an hour on this or more. Of course, you did your whole dissertation <laughs> on it. People have whole departments of it. Yes. There's a lot of good insights coming out of the Department of History at UNC Pembroke. Good research and publications and excellent teaching. Thanks to my guest, Dr. David Walton, for sharing his expertise on the African diaspora. Thank you for watching and please join me again to explore the life of the mind and the world of ideas.